everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within Podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. Uh, I've worked there for about the past 10 years, so I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. They're predominantly working with the plant medicine ayahuasca, uh, working in the Shipibo lineage, which uh, they're a group of people who have a very long lineage of working with these plants. And it's a plant healing medicine center in the jungles of Peru, near the city of Iquitos. And it's a really beautiful place to go and experience the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the teaching that these plants have to offer. And to do that in a space that's really well held and that's really conducive to going very deeply into this work. They have an amazing team there, an amazing support staff, an integration team, a, a team of amazing uh, healers and doctors and facilitators. So if that's been on your mind, uh, check out their website because they, they do really great work. Um, their website is templetheawayoflight.org. Also, myself and my colleague Marav Artsy, who I interviewed in, I think, episode 28 of the show, are continuing to run dietas or diets in the Sacred Valley of Peru. Um, we just finished one in New York that went really well, and we're continuing to do that work beginning in September for the entire month of September. That's a really amazing opportunity to go very deeply into the world of plant medicine, to, to go into isolation, and to work with one plant specifically, and to really experience all of the, the benefits that, that that plant as an individual has to offer. So if you'd like more information about that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org and also Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. Uh, my guest for today's show is my friend John Schott. Uh, I met John uh, uh, a number of years ago uh, through my friend John Keegan, who I interviewed a couple episodes ago. We all had a similar teacher and mentor. His name was Dr. David Jubbs, who's a really amazing human being. And we studied a lot about nutrition and plants and plant medicine, food as medicine. So it was really great for me to sit down and catch up with him and, and pick his mind a little bit about what he's learned and kind of his own growth and evolution and what he's come to discover for himself. So I think you all will find this uh, conversation hopefully really fascinating. He's a, a really interesting guy with a wealth of knowledge, and, uh, and I really enjoy talking to him. So as always, if you're able to help support this podcast, that's a really big help. Um, it actually takes quite a bit of work to put all of these shows together, from the organizing, the interviewing, the editing, and publishing, and all that stuff. So if you're able to support financially, that's a really big help. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, Patreon is a really good way. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. There's different tiers you can sign up for, and it gives you also some things back, which are really nice. Things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&A. Um, so that's a, a really big help. There's also the option of donating directly via PayPal. And also with the YouTube channel now, there's an option to do it that way via the Join button uh, right below this video. Um, if you're not able to do that, uh, subscribing to the show is a really big help. Turning on the notification bell, liking the video on the YouTube page, and then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, also following the show, and leaving a starred rating and a short review. That's also a really big help with the algorithms to get this show out to a bigger and broader audience. So I think that's it with the introduction. And without further ado, here is my conversation with John. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. I'm running out from the maze, running out from the maze, run out of the maze today. Um, yeah, so we, we have a mutual friend. I actually just interviewed him my yeah. first two podcasts ago, uh, John Keegan. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we met we met in New York. Um, we were in an acting class together. And then we found Dr. David Jobs, okay. which I think is kind of a mutual connection. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and John knew you, and I, I didn't know you until I came here to Miami a couple of years ago when we met. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe just for the audience, like a, a little bit of background, like what's your story, where you came from, what got you interested in, in the work you're doing? Yeah, thank you, man. And thanks for inviting me here. Um, my story, honestly, I always tell 
I always say that it started when I was about nine years old. Um, I, I've, since I was a little kid, I, I often thought that there was something strange about the, the way the world is, is or was constructed. And there was a discrepancy between certain you know, uh, elements of social um, presence in, in the world where there's people, because I grew up in Colombia, in Cartagena, and so I saw that there was a, an imbalance in the way that some people live versus the way that I lived. You know, I, I, I feel like I grew up in the social strata of, of Colombia that was very privileged, you know, uh, and I grew up there. So since I was a little kid, I thought that something didn't feel quite right. And I made it, I made a decision. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I made a decision that I'm very passionate about figuring out what's best for humanity and how I can contribute to that since I was a little kid. So throughout my whole growing up process, it's always been an, an, you know, an exploration of how I can get there. Uh, and going to New York, for instance, you know, I graduated from high school in Colombia and I came here first to Miami. And in Miami, I went through the whole thing, you know, I worked at a fast food joint, which is hilarious, but I, you know, I worked at a fast food restaurant place and went to the whole, you know, community college ordeal and followed everything that I was technically supposed to. And I didn't really have much guidance when it came to what, what really matters, you know, and, and how, we, how the impact of a human can transfer over to something else other than the typical box that we get thrown into. So after a while, I kept going through university and all that, and I just get, got fed up with it. And I said, I, I want to go to New York because I want to explore filmmaking and acting and all this stuff. The way I see it, or the way I saw it was, man, these celebrities and these people, high profile people, have so much influence on people back then, and they still do, but uh, I was like, but I see very few of them giving a very different message, or at least a, a more sustainable, regenerative, more community-minded message of being uh, a, a, a species of humans that resemble something more like, this is me now, after so much exploration and anthropological exploration and how hunter-gatherers lived and egalitarian societies and things like that, uh, I, I didn't know what that was back then, but I felt like there's got to be something better than that. And, you know, so I went through that path. But parallel to that, I was also exploring myself and how I can become the best version of myself. And that led me to a lot of things with, like, to Tony Robbins. And the food piece came in through that, through, through a one of his CDs that I was listening to, uh, talking about alkalinity and acidity and you know and, and, and greens and all these different things, and I was like, wow, I've never heard of anything like this. Uh, this is very common now, you know. It's it, but back then, which was maybe I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, it was kind of like, wow, this is eye opening. So I went to explore that while I was trying to explore the film acting route, and what happened was that. I wound up at, the, at Dr. Job's place because he was doing a lot of really ex incredible stuff with liver detoxing and herbs and the life food piece of regeneration through 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 that kind of like cyclical um, elements uh, through alkaline and, and acidic, you know, uh, balances in the biology in the biology of the of the human uh, person and and. I decided to go full on that route because the other part with the acting and the modeling or whatever it was that I was trying to get into became very dark and it was something that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't progress in that. Uh, I, I had experiences that, we, we, I mean, we can get into it, but it's not even worth getting into as far as like some of these agents and some of these uh, companies wanting me to do things that were unethical to me and I didn't want to play that game. So I was like, man, forget this. I'm having a lot of success learning about nutrition and cellular rejuvenation and, you know, the, the impact of nutrition and health and wellness and all this stuff. And I just dove into that. So I was working at a raw food place in the weekends and, and at nights to make an income and tips and, you know, waiter. And I was doing internship with Dr. Job the rest of the, the, the week for, you know, just to earn. And I had this hunger and all that stuff. And I learned so much. And I decided to bring it back here to Miami. And at that point, I started just evolving my practice and everything that I just did from there on. 
keeping some things that are still to this day extremely valuable and extremely powerful when it comes to rejuvenating the body, especially the liver, and also just just learning other elements of ancestral diets, and I got into Western A. Price, and a couple other things that, you know, filled in gaps, especially when, when my wife got pregnant. Because, um, you know, it's one thing to experiment with yourself. Uh, when it comes to your children, you know, you want to you wanna follow at least a template that has, you know, historical elements of, okay, what it doesn't mean to be, what, what is the human diet? So that's a little bit of, of the background for me. Um, and, and I'm constantly learning more. Um, you know, I, as, as the layers kept opening up for me, I started working with the idea of living water. What, what's the best water we can get? Movement, fascia, releasing trigger points and things like that so that we can end any type of adhesions and calcification, fibrosis, uh, elements that the human being is basically right now being exposed to in a very un unnatural way. And then I started learning about it, the electromagnetic frequencies and artificial blue light and the circadian rhythms of the body. And, and at, at the end of the day, you start to pull back and you start to think, oh, what I'm doing is trying to recreate what a wild human is supposed to have so that he or she is not overly domesticated in the current environment and reclaim a little bit of that natural wildness so that we can become not only fully healthy and thriving and you know the best version of ourselves, but be more integral with what what natural living is, because that's one of the things that I, I'm seeing, especially today, uh, you know, with a lot of the push towards um, you know transhumanist agendas and, and artificial you know AI and things like that. I think you know there's no I, I don't think that's going to go away. They're really like pushing forth with that tremendously. My thing is okay. How can we become fit for all those environments in a very balanced way? And in a way that incorporates the earth, uh, because you know, for so many you know thousands of years, we've been basically taking advantage and pillaging the earth in ways that are not sustainable. Uh, they don't take into consideration the the lifeblood of the planet. They don't take into consideration some of the soil cycles um, and things like that. So once we become more capable of being the best humans we can be, I think our choices become a better driver of the outcome that we want for society. So that's that's kind of my deal right now. <laughs> what was that like with you for Jobs? Because he, he was a guy who had a real influence on in my life, and, yeah. and uh, you know, it's interesting because you talked about this idea of experimentation, and mm -hmm. you know, I, I was also an actor, and I think that was one of the things that fascinated me about acting or trying all these different spiritual paths, different diets. Yeah. It was almost this like like this trial aspect, this like. Let me go full on into this and like see what the results are. And, yeah. and you know, this real curiosity. But he was someone who he really had an impact on me. There was just things he would say that would really like shift like how I would see something. And, yeah. You know, I, I've I've gone pretty deeply now into this world of plant medicines mm -hmm. and shamanism. And when I look back, he was actually the first person I met who I would actually call in a way a shaman. Like you know, the, the way he, he looked at things, talked about things, was very much that kind of shamanic way of, like, shifting people's perspective on, on things. And he had this really amazing ability to do it. Um, yeah. So what was that like? And, and Because, you know, it's it's quite a, like, radical, in a way, way of looking at, yeah. at food and plants and life and, and just yeah. what it means to be a human being, really. Yeah, I mean, you hit it right on the, you know, right on the nose. It, David is a fascinating, fascinating character. Um, he has, you know, he's one of those brilliant minds that, you know, is tapped into something that most people are not. And I agree with you at that point, uh, he had so, a huge impact on me as well. And I think anybody who went into that job longevity little place in the East Village had that kind of, of impact that came from his, from his teachings. Um, it was it, it, certain things you would see them and you were like, man, this is very extreme. But I I didn't see him like that at that point. I and and to to be honest, it's like there's cycles of things that you do, and I've learned that because at some point I was all in with his protocols and everything that he was doing, but I was also noticing a lot of deficiencies in myself. So you can't be on a completely cleansing detox diet all the time. You have to rebuild at some point. 
But yeah, he totally, uh, you know, I, I think even today, honestly, like he's still way ahead <laughs> of, of, of what, you know, I think some elements of the world and are still kind of catching up to where he is. Uh, for a lot of people, he's very hard to understand because he's speaking a different language. Even though he'll speak a lot of things that'll get you and you're like, wow, okay, yeah, this makes sense. And he's tapped into something and you intuitively feel like he's in it for the good reasons. You know, he's not, he wasn't ever trying to take advantage, at least not for me. Uh, my experience with him was great. Um, but at the same time, I also had, I was fortunate because I also was interning there almost every day. So I did see the challenges that he went through as well as a human. So he wanted to live in a shamanic state most of the time. But the world, you know, is not a shamanic state right now. And so he had he had a lot of like um, things that he had to work through. And and that was very you know, he learned a lot from that I think and I learned a lot from his experience and all that. And you know, I always have a, a special place in my heart for him because he, he was one of my first mentors in that sense. And I still use his liver gallbladder flushes and, 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 you know, I think there's a place in, I have to, I have to check in with somebody that, that in Las Vegas, I think they have a jumps, uh, longevity place that has its herbs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, man, that, that I've been in herbology for a long time. I play around with my own herbs and do teas and do this and that. And I've tried other people's products and other people's creations and things like that. But David's, David's combinations of those herbs that he put together, to me, to this day, still are like one of the top, you know. And, and I think somebody's providing a service to have his herbs uh, so that people can get it. So, yeah, I mean, there's still things that I'm like, man, how could I get that easy tea? I don't know if you ever had that one. But talk about, you know, there's a lot of talk about nootropics. You know, nootropic, nootropics have been very popular in the last few years, especially like in the quote-unquote biohacking world, where they're telling, taking qualia or this or that. And, you know, they're trying to use isolated elements to create like that focus and that like extra edge for when you have to like really think and, and perform and, you know, that whole like, ah, oh, you know, I have to, you know, be an entrepreneur that, that takes the world by storm. And those herbs that he was working with, especially that one, I haven't found a nootropic that has, and that's natural, that has come even close to that. You know, to this day, I, I think about it. I'm like, and what was in there? <laughs> I knew it back then, uh, but the way he put it together, you know, take a tea of that with the Brazil nut milk and a little bit of wild honey and all this stuff, and you're like, man, this is unbelievable. So, and that's great because it still influences me in a sense where the, the connection with nature is what, what I think a lot of us are all uh, hungering for in one way or the other, even if it's as simple as grounding, going to the beach, taking your shoes off at the park, um, you know, disconnecting your wireless at night when you sleep, to try to calm the nerves down, you know, to take the, the, the element of stress and, and try to, to balance it out because stress is such a huge thing nowadays, especially with the year and a half that we've gone through from 2020 till now. I mean, it's a fear-based, it's a fear-based world that people have been pushed into. And it doesn't feel right, you know, it doesn't. And there's other ways, you know, I've never bought into it. Uh, I've been doing, pretty much living my life almost the same with, in the beginning there were more restrictions and things like that in 2020, but I never stopped because there was no element of like, there's this little tiny little virus which is basically, you know, an exosome or, 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 or waste product that we all produce anyways that is just getting cleared out of the body. And it doesn't overtake people the way that they're showing them. It's not contagious the way that people are, 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 are trying to scare others with the whole element of it, you know. And, and then you start digging into those rabbit holes and you, um, you start going, hmm, this is, this is about control. This is about control, and the thing is that part of my mission is to kind of help people like wake up on their own by by reminding them and reminding myself. Sometimes you have to remind yourself this is this is not this is not a full picture. 
this is not real the way that they're telling us that it is. And there's something way more than that. And once you connect to that, you're free. You know, like you're really, really free. Even though you're still in the system, you start to operate in a way that, you know, your, your mind and your heart become free to become a full human being. One that needs to be touched, one that needs to be interact with other human beings, one that doesn't need to be six feet apart, one that has never had in the history of humanity that be anything that's healthy for us. So, you know, or be locked up inside a home where, where, where you know, it's artificial paint and artificial air and deep, it's not ionized air and it's not the air that you can breathe that gives you vitality from true oxygenation of the body. So those are things that I try to help people recreate for themselves and also start to have that perspective. Because I always say it, man, and it's, it blows my mind that we have the numbers to just stand up for ourselves and be like, no, we don't have to take this anymore. We don't have to be violent, but we also have to stand up and go, okay, enough is enough, and let's move into a different world that we want to see that has so much potential, so much potential. So, um, yeah, no, I, I went a little bit on that. <laughs> I don't there. You mentioned um, some of that stuff I'd love to get back to, but in the beginning you mentioned uh, also Weston Price. Mm -hmm. um, if people aren't familiar with that, why... Why was that also impactful? Because you also mentioned this idea of like, like with a child, like, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Because you were saying this difference between it's great to experiment on ourselves yeah. because at the end of the day we're also responsible for, yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. But it, it is, I think, something very different when we're responsible for for someone or something else, and and I think there's so much to be learned from tradition. Yeah. You know, like people didn't just do things for no reason. Yeah. You know. And, and most of these things like required extra work. There was like a, a, a process of you know grinding something by hand yeah. rather than yeah. you know some other way. Like and I mean that was one of the amazing things I remember Jeb saying is he would recommend olive oil that was organic, cold pressed, extra virgin, but also stone ground. Stone ground. Yeah. And in the beginning, I remember thinking like that seems a little crazy. Like, but then I remember reading a few years ago, and like you said, very much being ahead of his time, there was some study that came out, and they found only in stone ground olive oil that there was like these phytonutrients yeah. that even in cold pressed olive oil yeah. didn't exist. Didn't exist absolutely. Um, because even at that slight temperature to heat it up like that, you lost those, and yeah. they were like these incredible compounds. Yeah, um, it's medicine. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Like herbs and and spices and things that traditionally we've been using as part of our cuisine. You know, food doesn't need to be bland and, the, you know, there's, there was, it's not so much anymore, but back then, you know, in the early 70s, I think too, where, you know, the whole health alternative, you know, health food stores and things like that, there was this idea that food to be healthy had to be bland. Um, and there's influence with, with Kellogg and a couple other people that were trying to like lower people's libidos and try to like manipulate the sexuality, the natural sexuality of the human being with it. And that's one of the reasons why they made the choices that they made as far as like, whoa, what's a healthy diet for people? Uh, but aside from that, you know, that richness of, of flavor that comes from an olive oil like that, oregano, and some of these spices and things that we still have access to is, is very powerful. And then it, you just get a signature of, you know, of what's natural that gets put into your body. Uh, because we we become somewhat accustomed to the being complacent with not doing enough work for several things, you know, like everything's pre prepackaged for people, everything's pre processed for people, um, you know, even chewing becomes like uh, you know yeah, this 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 thing that is a pain, uh, and our ancestors you had to had to work for that. It didn't mean they were like, you know, they had a less quality of life because of it. Actually, they, in theory, they had a better quality of life because they did spend hours a week procuring their food and preparing them and, and preserving it. But they also had like, besides that, they, that was mainly the, what, you know, making a few tools and things like that. That was mainly what work was. And the rest of the time it was leisure, it was community, it was dancing, it was all these things that make us more wild humans and not wild in a bad way. Uh, that's another thing that I get into with people, you know, like they, we start talking about the concept of being wild and immediately they think all oh, these wildness is like this element of being a savage, you know, somebody who's unrefined or uncivilized and this and that. When the true 
definition of it is something that is free and it, it cannot be tamed in the way where it's sovereign. And that's, that's the concept of wildness that I, I try to like talk to people about because it gets them going, oh, okay, that's not, oh, okay, so you're, you're talking about this in that perspective and that, that feels okay for me, that feels good to me and I can relate to that actually. I think every human can relate to that. We still have it in there. <laughs> Even though we're, you know, navigating through very artificial uh, environments, so um, yeah, yeah. You mentioned a really interesting idea, kind of this this metaphor that, that food is also, in a way, like representative in our body, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the myofascial stuff. Mm -hmm. and what was what was that exploration like for you? Like beginning to to go from the food to to beginning to understand the body as well. That was a really neat exploration, and that, that brought up a second mentor for me. Um, that one came hand in hand with my exploration with water. Um, there's a gentleman in California, in Laguna Beach, called, his name is Glenn Calkins. And his story is really impressive because he's another one of these guys that are very brilliant, high IQ character. Um, but his story is interesting because he, he used to do you know, all these like um, snowboarding and high impact like sports when he was younger and this and that. And he beat his body up so much that, you know, he got to a point when he was, I think, in his 40s. And his, you know, the doctor said, oh, your, your, your spine is, you know, was, uh, you have a lot of fusion in it. You can't move. You're going to have to be in a pharmaceutical for the rest of your life because you're like, there's nothing we can do about it. And he's like, no, I'm not going to take that. There is something I can do about it. So he made it his mission to heal himself from all that. And then a big portion of that was the water. So he wanted to recreate through the system that I still use to this day, uh, what's called Hunza water or, or water that, you know, has magnesium in bicarbonate form. It's, you know, has an imprint of, of, of nature in it with lodestone crystals purified 100%. So he recreated that water and tapped into the magnesium bicarbonate piece and that magnesium bicarbonate with the water and the bodywork started to rip down all that calcium deposits that, that he had accumulated through wear and tear, through trauma, through all these things. And he's, his body started to become very supple. Mm -hmm. So now this, this, this Glenn right now is, I want to say he's 65. And you see him and he's like doing Russian splits, handstands. I've worked on him, you know, last time I went to California, which was a while back with the stepping with, with my feet because he has like a Walker GC method that he uses. Uh, and I, I'm pushing on his, you know, hamstrings and everything. He's just laughing with no pain. And that was the thing. You know, when, when you push on somebody and there's pain, you know there's adhesions there. And you know that the fascia or the collagen and, and the protein matrix of the body is compromised. And that's not normal. So when you see people like becoming very stone-like, like with arthritis and they're becoming like very hard, that's usually that calcification, fibrosis, uh, elements that be make people very hard. And you can reverse that. It's not, it's, it's, very, it's a very simple method. You clean your water, you take magnesium, and you do a little bit of body work, and you can reverse that. Now, the body, the body work in the beginning is excruciating because we're, we're taking basically the pain that's in there, and we're liberating that stuff out. So it's not like I'm causing anybody any kind of pain. Uh, it's just there. And once we take the folds and unwind them, in a way where the calcium starts to get dissolved through your body processes the, and magnesium and all these other things, uh, man, it's, um, it's unbelievable. You, you feel not only younger, but things, you know, uh, things that used to be hurt people, you know, like knee pain and back pain and neck pain and all this stuff, they stop. And that's when I got into the body work, when I met him and was doing a lot of research on his water system. So that was my, my end point. I was like, wow, this thing's blowing my mind. Um, I hadn't had access to this, and this is an integral part of the strategy here. So I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to start to apply it. So I became a body worker in that way. Um, not a massage therapist, but like a body worker in that way where I'm taking people through this whole uh, session of unwinding that tissue and breaking down some of these deposits that we accumulate to, you know, MPK farming, acid rain, the soil not being proper, excess calcium from, let's say, you know, uh, too, much, too much vitamin D like supplementation, excess calcium from calcium supplementation, excess calcium from so many different avenues. 
and you can reverse that. And once you do, you 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 become like very healthy, very healthy. So that's that was when I started like really jumping into the the whole myofascial body work element. And then I started to do my own research on it with myofascial release and and the work of Tom Myers with anatomy trains and fascia and how all these different slings of the body basically just coexist with each other. And then I started to get a little bit, now I'm getting a little bit more into a system of movement called functional patterns and MoveNet, MoveNet which stands for uh, Move Naturally. And that's basically recreating the, the patterns that a human is meant to do. Throw, run, walk, crawl, jump, all these things. If you have some of these adhesions and some of these restrictions, then you can't do everything. So we bring you back through the movement and through the body work to become a full expression of what the human is capable of. And it's fantastic. It's fascinating. I mean, even my daughter knows it now. <laughs> she works on me. It's, it's such a gift. She's 11. So, um, you know, it's it's little things and, and they work. Can you talk about water? Because I think that's a really common one that the people have a lot of thoughts on yeah. and a lot of beliefs around and um, you know even like I, I was with my grandmother recently and like growing up there was a spring on our land and that's where yeah. she got all the water from yeah and you know eventually the, the state came around and like blocked the spring and there was another spring down the road and it blocked that one you know for like health health reasons yeah. but um, I mean that that's there's so much too, you know, because you mentioned that idea of like living water. There's a life energy to that water. It's, yeah. it, it has minerals. It's going through the earth. It's moving. It, yeah. it comes to you in that natural state. To some degree, our tap water is moving, but it's, you know, being treated yeah. and chemicals in it. And then we get bottled water, which is just leaching sitting plastic. there and leaching plastic. Yeah. And... Yeah. The water, the water is extremely important. Uh, we live in a water based planet. Uh, we are water-based beings. Technically, we're supposed to be by weight 70% water. Um, if you go into cellularly, it's even more than that. And so it's a huge important thing. It's like uh, it's if you take an analogy of a fish tank. You know what's more important for that fish? Is it the best non-GMO fish flakes, or making sure that that water that they live in is clean and the right kind? And usually, that water is the first step for that. Besides the bubbler that's putting oxygen into the water into its environment so with, with us humans it's the same thing what I try to teach people is that um, I still always recommend pristine hydro and, I, and I'll tell you the reason why um, he basically like I said if we were living pre uh, industrial revolution the natural the natural water that you would drink would be that spring water that bubbles from the earth fossil what they call fossil water um, because it naturally gets vortexed you know, like you mentioned tap water. Tap water goes through a series of pipes that have angles that are not conducive to having a water that's moving in the right pattern. Uh, that's one thing about tap water that's like uh, one, one of the main reasons I don't recommend it besides it having chemicals and, you know, other elements that are going back to the calcification. You know, when you have a high TDS water, which stands for total dissolved solids, the, the, the filtering system of your body, which is uh, the kidneys, they are stressed more and then they can, they can have the capacity of. So you start accumulating some of these dissolved solids, these minerals that are not natural, these minerals that are not meant to be, you know, that are not being processed through nature, that start to accumulate. That's one of the reasons why you get that hardness and it's hard water. But uh, aside from that, you know, that fossil water pre-industrial revolution used to be pristine. It used to run through vortexes, just through the natural movements of the earth. Uh, that's technically what we're supposed to drink. Now, after industrial revolution, you know, the thing got more complicated through acid rain, NPK farming, and things like that, where it's very hard nowadays to find a pristine spring water. Uh, even if you bottle it in glass, you know, the source is very important. Uh, I'll give you an example, Mountain Valley spring water. They claim, oh, this is the best spring water, but it's very high in calcium, and it'll tell you on the label. You know, I've had many clients that that's the only water they used to drink, and I would feel it on their tissues. I'm telling you, I, I would tell them, look, look into this and, and, and stop with the Mountain Valley and get something else. You know, you don't have to get pristine hydro, but get something that's purified first. You want the water to be, you know, 100% contaminant-free. Ideally, you want it to be acid-free, which the pristine hydro does. Uh, 
and then you know because it removes all the acids from from the tap water and then you want to reinvigorate it with things that are living like bicarbonates and that's the that's the brilliance of that system of what he recreated he was basically mimicking like i said the hunza water the water that we're meant to drink which has like a little cloudiness to it and that's coming from bicarbonates bicarbonates are essential for any kind of cellular process and and these bicarbonates we we create them in our pancreas but as our pancreas gets stressed and we're bombarded with so many toxins and all these stuff, we start to produce less bicarbonates. So that whole system starts to get downgraded. And when we start to supplement with a magnesium bicarbonate, um, and if it's in the water from the system, then we start to replenish that. And you, you, you get the best type of magnesium and you also get the best type of cellular function you can get. So that whole water element, you know, and and, and and the imprinting of something natural through lodestone and quartz crystals, which is in the system, also gives it that natural signature. It imprints that mechanism of something that came from the earth into the water. So you're basically recreating that in from you know from your tap, and it goes through all those processes and it comes out through. So it's a sustainable option for somebody who lives in a city, and somebody who doesn't have access to that deep deep fossil water, um, which is still you know. You don't, you don't know you don't know anymore because like I said that acid rain and MPK farming and all the residuals that come from modern agriculture especially things like factory farm which is horrible all that stuff goes back into the soil and it goes back into the hydrological cycle so we need a strategy nowadays to clean the water and and, and you do the best you can you know uh, some people can't afford it so we start you know get a Berkey and put a cartridge and start there you know, and work your way to invest in something that completely cleans the water. And that's why I'm a big fan of their, their system. There's other systems out there that are pretty decent, pretty good, that are similar. Um, but that's the one I've, I've always liked. So for many, many years, that's the one I've been using. So it's, it works. Yeah. So what has that been like, your, your journey from, from raw food, Weston Price? Where, where do you find yourself now, kind of? like seeing what's what's more and more an ideal diet yeah. for people. Because obviously that's changing. Yeah. Um, it's changing with the times. I mean, I mean, I was talking to Keegan even the other day. I mean, even like that idea of raw food, that was very foreign. And now mm -hmm. I just went to a place today and they were like serving raw food. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these little things like grass-fed meat, you know, mm -hmm. like 30 years ago, most people never even thought about that. Yeah. And you see it everywhere. Keto, like you see that everywhere now. Yeah gluten-free like you see that everywhere so obviously like a lot of ideas take hold yeah. which which are rooted in something uh, beneficial so what do you where do you find yourself at in, in all of that I, I I try to go through cycles but there's a foundation that I follow Western price would Western a price would probably be a good starting point to, to lay a foundation of what's real food it's a conscious omnivorous diet um, Western price was a dentist that traveled around the world I think it was in the 50s and he was actually looking for the perfect diet for humanity. And he was expecting to find that the perfect specimens of humans would be vegan. And that's what he was going for. So he went to Maasai tribes. He went to uh, the, the Swiss uh, cultures in Europe. He went to like many different places. And he did not find one vegan culture. What he found was a pattern of people who were tapping into their, their natural environment that was local. And they, they were procuring foods through an ancestral type of template where they would gather a lot of food, roots, vegetables, fruit, things like that, which to me is a very important part of the, the, the diet. There's people who are like on a carnivore diet that think that you don't need vegetables, you don't need fruit and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, that's a modern, you know, you didn't see that either. You know, you never really, even, even when you go to, um, you know, uh, colder climates where you would see uh, Inuit people who they didn't really have too much access to to vegetables because of the climate. Even them, when they would hunt some other game, they would seek out some of the pre-processed vegetables from their guts and figure out a way of getting some of that algae and some of that, you know, it was very important to them, you know. So, uh, so Weston A. Price went on this journey to try to find uh, these these. The, the perfect diet and he found that all of them had animal foods in common and he started to look at it through the dentition of 
of these tribes. None of them had cavities. Their mouth was completely full of the perfect structure for their teeth. Um, they were robust. There was no, you know, overweight people when he went to these tribes, whether it was, and these are were diff, very different people from different parts of the world, but they had that common element to them. And so I looked into that because I, after a while on a raw food diet, even a light food diet, I was becoming weaker. I was becoming too skinny. I couldn't put on muscle and then my wife got pregnant. And I'm like, if I'm not thriving with this program, I don't know if I want to experiment with my kids. So let me go and look anthropologically and all this stuff at what is the natural <laughs> human diet. And that's where Western Price came in, some of the paleo diets went in, came into, into the thing, and, and, and the foundation is that. Man. It's just like try to emulate a little bit of what the hunter-gatherer archetype is for, you know, and we live in a modern day world where as much as you want to recreate that, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same environment, it's not that. So for me, for instance, after that foundation, I also look towards where I'm living. I'm living in a very in a very tropical place where the sunshine actually is a very high, you know, sun and, and, and light has a lot of biophotonic nutrition value to it. Not just vitamin D, but it has a lot of elements. So you can get away with a little bit less food because you live in a tropical uh, environment. You can eat more fruit which is actually more available here, like mame, papaya, you know, all these different tropical fruits that are in, incredible, and I thrive on that. So I'll still eat a, a good amount of fruit, some vegetables, and a little bit of protein. I found my balance. Now there's times where it becomes, I, I feel intuitively, okay, it's time for me to do a detox, and I'll do some nutritional fasting a la David John. I'll do like a liver cleanse, or, you know, with the, with the electrolyte lemonade, and all this stuff. Like, thankfully, I know how to do that. I know how to work with the castor oil packs, the coffee enemas, the, all this stuff. Uh, and then after you do a cycle of that, or a couple cycles of that, you feel like, okay, we just re, re, recalibrated the whole system. And then you just keep finding your balance. Uh, you know, one of the things that I always tell, you know, parents is, who, who they, they, they really have it in their mind that, you know, veganism is the best way. I just say caution to them because it is an experimental diet. And it's fine that you experiment, but just notice your child how they're doing. Because I've seen way too many kids that are failing to thrive on that kind of diet. And they're not, they don't have everything that they need to create uh, a fully formed brain, you know, fully formed physiology and things like that. Some, some, you know, we're all different. Some people thrive more on high plant, high fruit and all this stuff. And some people are more, you know, they tend to thrive on more high animal foods and all this stuff with a little bit of plant foods. Um, but those are the extremes usually. Most of all of us fall somewhere in, in the middle where we have a good balance of things. So, you know, I don't get into carbohydrates and keto and all this stuff anymore. I, you know, I eat what's natural as much as possible and get the best source you can because the one thing that all these diets have in common, at least, which is a very positive thing, whether it's gluten free, you know, grass fed. Uh, beef, uh, paleo diets, keto diets, uh, vegan diets, and all this stuff, they really tend to focus on how to avoid factory farming and how to avoid, you know, genetically modified foods and over chemicalize elements of the food. That's our first step right there. You know, we need to end that. Um, there's no, that's not hunting or gathering. That's not, you know, there's no ethical, moral, element there that's actually very horrendous and you can't treat beings like that you know this is a sacred thing that Native Americans in this country used to be very tapped into and some of these tribes that this this gentleman dentist Western Price understood as well once he started to get to know these people that he was seeking out there was a sacred element of being made of place you know of the place where you're at and that sometimes involves animal foods. Um, so, you know, sometimes people thrive with, with grass-fed, good quality dairy. You know, I, I don't do well with that. Um, maybe a little bit of ghee or something like that, but, but some people thrive with like a really good quality grass-fed raw milk and so forth. So we find our balance. But if you start with a foundation where, you know, just focus more on whole foods, uh, root vegetables, vegetables, fruits, good quality proteins, you know, try to approach it. I approach it mostly uh, um, with a kingdom 
perspective, kingdoms of light perspective. There's the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungal kingdom, which also brings into the fold some of these medicinal mushrooms that are very important in our day and age, especially with the immune, immune factors that they have so that it keeps our immune system, you know, in, in the fight. Uh, and then bacteria is another kingdom of life. That means cultured foods like sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, yogurts and things like that that traditionally people have been doing for thousands of years so I, I always you know like to say hey you know start thinking about it in with the element of the kingdoms of life and where is that coming from because at the end of the day most of these new diets they're all different versions of the same thing if you really think about it they're modern modern diets that are meant to sell books they're meant to sell programs they're meant to be a repackaged form of the same thing but with a different uh, a, a different um, perspective to it. So, do you think a big part of, of really changing any diet is just like the elimination aspect? Is, yes. Because when you switch to any diet, you automatically kind of de facto cut out a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And then, two, everything you are putting in, you're actually like conscious of that. Yeah. So it's, you know, almost in a way, any diet. It at least has some, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some tradition behind it or some benefit yeah, yeah. to it. You're you're already like making a big step. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, it's a, I'm glad you brought up that point because I, you know I also start with that. You know, okay, what where are you getting your food from? Is it from a factory? Is it from somewhere where they're processing uh, foods with rancid, oxidized oils like the polyunsaturated fatty acids, like canola oil, you know, corn oil, soybean oil, things like that. If, if you're still getting some of that, okay, then this is where we begin. You know, start to change your oil to something like coconut oil or grass-fed ghee or cold pressed high-quality extra virgin olive oil. Traditional fats like that. The ones that are heat-stable or that have been traditionally used and cherished for generations. Uh, because these, these, these modern oils that basically are extremely overly processed, they're, they're one of the main factors to why we're having so many different inflammatory challenges, be it diabetes, be it obesity, heart disease, and things like that. And once you start to take that out and replace it with something else, like an oil change, then that's a big step in the, in the right direction. And then you start to become aware. You start to become aware, oh, okay, what else am I like really consuming that's not the best? You know, um, Again, I have kids. They like little snacks and things like that. So as a parent, you go, man, they want to eat what the other kids are eating and this and that. Okay. Thankfully, like this market has blossomed into something where you're getting companies like Siete Foods and things like that, that they're making, making like chips from uh, avocado oil or coconut oil. And they're using things like yuca or like cassava as their, you know, and it's like, okay, the kids like that. And they can have a few chips here and there with salsa or whatever it is. And they're not getting those rancid oxidized oils, which are very problematic. And then you start to peel the layers off. Okay, what is gluten? What? Why is that a problem? Okay, what? Why? Why is that a challenging for people? Where does it come from? You know, and you start to peel layers and layers. Okay, we need we need to eat some sugar, but what is sugar? High fructose corn syrup is sugar, but wildflower raw unfiltered honey, which is a superfood in many ways because of the enzymes and the B vitamins and some of the stuff that we you know we cherish, is a whole different element. You know, fresh fruit. That's ripe. It's a it's a type of carbohydrate, it's a type of sugar that gives you fuel. It's way different than high fructose corn syrup. So if you're still eating high fructose corn syrup, that's where we go, okay, how about we get rid of this one and start to bring in some of these. Maple syrup, creating high quality maple syrup. We've been tapping trees uh, you know, for generations. And it's a natural blood, you know, it's like, like the lifeblood of the tree. And if you do it with reverence, and you do it not to overexert the tree, which some people know how to do, that's a different game than, again, the corn syrup and stuff like that. So you take steps. It depends. Everybody's on a different, everybody's on a different um, part of the journey. So uh, one thing that I always like to tell people who are like either starting off or maybe confused about something is like, take a deep breath. Don't get overwhelmed. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of contradictory information. Just go one step at a time. Think about some of these things, the kingdoms, the processed foods, all this stuff. You say, it's just go step by step and do your best. Because the worst thing that can happen is that they get overwhelmed. 
they are too hard on themselves and then they quit and they don't change anything. Um, so I, I like to always make sure that that awareness is there. That's something uh, Judge used to say a lot was, uh, at the end of the day, be gentle. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely. Something I've noticed a lot in my work is, uh, I mean, probably when I started, I'd say, I mean, these are just kind of rough numbers, but maybe like 10% of people have gut issues. Mm -hmm. Now I'd say it's probably like 50, 60%. Yeah. Um, just general discomfort, bloating. Yeah. Leaky gut syndrome, uh, SIBO, you know, I mean, yeah. there's a whole host of things yeah. now. Um, do you have a sense of where that's coming from? Do you think it's just myriad factors, the EMFs, the Wi-Fi, the genetically modified foods, lots of hybridized food, sugars, or do you think there's something it's all specific? That. It's basically all that. Uh, I would say that if I had to put it on, on, on uh, hierarchy, I would say the glyphosate, genetically modified foods and the spray, that they're putting in the wheat and some and a lot of like the products like soybeans and, and wheat and and you know that's one of the things that's creating a lot of this doc, uh, gut dysbiosis um ems are definitely involved in that and the, and the chemical just the chemical onslaughts so if you start to the reason i always say like gluten free is great is because usually when you do that you're 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 by default getting rid of the glyphosate foods because, you know, you hear it all the time, you know, you go to Italy or somewhere where they're like doing a traditional uh, regenerator to the, to the wheat. Uh, you, they're using maybe like an einkorn or, or something along those lines of, of, uh, of a grain that is soaked, it's fermented, it's this and that, and they form it into a sourdough bread or etc. Usually you don't get the same effect. And so what's the difference? The difference is the thing that they're spraying on the crops. So that's, that's by default, you know, it's not necessarily, it doesn't always have to be the gluten, which is the protein from the wheat. Uh, it's a, what Job used to say, a strange, a strange, undigestible protein. There's a lot of that, right, coming into our food supply nowadays. And it's mostly coming from that. So I would put that there as top priority. Um, EMS right now is too big of a jump for most people. Um, we should have awareness around it. And I give people tips in the book and, 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 and with my work. Okay, turn off the Wi-Fi at night. You know, don't put the phone close to you. Uh, these electromagnetic frequencies affect the mitochondria in ways where, again, going back to calcification, they, the, the calcium channels inside the cell get over, overrun with the excess calcium that comes from that inflammatory impact from the electromagnetic frequencies. So you do things like that, and that helps people reduce the inflammatory effects of all these things. High fructose corn syrup too. I mean, there's high, high fructose corn syrup, if I'm not mistaken, gets sprayed like crazy. Corn gets sprayed like crazy with, with a lot of these chemicals as well. So those are gut disruptors. Those are like, they lacerate the walls of the colon. And you can regenerate that. Uh, but the first step is to take what's creating that inflammation and taking it out. So, yeah. Do you think, you know, because uh, we were talking a little bit before we got started about just kind of COVID and some of these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think like kind of that path we've been down, when you start looking into food, for example, like the GMOs, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's tons and tons of research saying there's no side effects. Mm -hmm. um, but I think anyone who looks at that you know, for every action, there, there's a reaction. Yeah. You know, nothing comes for free. Yeah. And that's a very, like, indigenous way of looking at the world, like a, a, a pagamento. Like they, there's a cost to everything. Yeah. Like, you know, and eventually those debts start accruing. Mm -hmm. um, even, like, literally from an economic point. Like, if you keep borrowing money, like, <laughs> yeah. at some point someone's going to come after you. you yeah. know, whether it's the mafia or the IRS, the government. But I think having studied food... You know, then you, you, I, I think we start to go down this rabbit hole of, of pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. and what these companies are actually doing and what some of the effects of these are. And, you know, it can get it can get also easy to fall into the trap of like all these people are evil. And, yeah. You know, I don't necessarily think that's the case, yeah. too. It's just there, there's motives for things. Yeah. There's, but I think for me, like going down that route of, of, uh, of 
of food and, and understanding what's going on, it became very clear that like there are nefarious actors at play mm -hmm. and, and that a lot of stuff is covered up. So when other things happen like COVID or, you know, when you, you start to see patterns yeah. and, and I think, you know, even in the work you're doing, like for me, like the basis of science or, or plant medicine or shamanism or, or any of these things, like one of the really fundamental things is pattern recognition. Yeah. You know, like, okay, I see that in that person. Can I learn something from that? Oh yeah, now I see it in them. Like, can I apply the same thing? Like, if yes, if it works, okay, then we found something. If it doesn't work, then it's not a pattern, it's something else. And, yeah. You know, like progressing like that. So do you think that's like something that, you know, I mean, I even remember, I think Jeb's talking about that, like EMFs, and that was like 20, 25, 20 years ago, maybe or something. Ago, yeah. And it, at that time, every, like nobody thought about it. Like mm -hmm. nobody, and and I remember, uh, you know, like if I'm in front of a computer for a long time, like I definitely feel something. Yeah. Now the science may say that's not true, but there's still a feeling there. Yeah. And I remember a big part of my work is is something called doing a dieta, and it's it's going into isolation, kind of fasting, drinking a, a plant to to, mm -hmm. to learn from it, to to heal by it. But I would remember coming out of these dietas and, you know, sometimes it, it's like two weeks, three weeks, a month, you know, complete isolation. Yeah. And then when I was finally finished, it was like, oh, man, I want to go to the city. And, um, and I would pick up my phone. And this happened a number of times. Now, again, this could be just complete whatever. But after, after having been isolated for so long, I'd pick up my phone and it would get so hot. Yeah that I have to put it down. Yeah. Like I couldn't hold it. Like I could feel this heat going into me and it, it like, it hurt in a way. So I have to put it down and it took a while, you know, a number of days before I started to like acclimate to it again. Yeah. But it was something like very visceral where I knew like there's something there, you know, now maybe, maybe when I'm not in that sensitive state, I, I build up natural defenses and it's not that big of a deal, but there's something there. Yeah. So I guess this is kind of a, a long-winded thing, but do you think like going down that that thing of food and and you know all these things, they be, you begin to see kind of patterns, and you begin to see well, if something is true here, then why would it not be true over here? Mm -hmm. If it's also true here, then why wouldn't it be true over there? Because it's the same mechanism that's feeding that yeah. in a way, and so you know it's it's something. It, because you mentioned this really interesting idea um, with food and, and just with health in general, like a lot of these things we're going down in this time and, and place of the world, they're not conducive to human health. Yeah. Like being in isolation, you know, as you said, like a cleansing diet, being in isolation, there's a benefit to that, but that's not how humans are meant to be. Yeah. Not having human touch, that's not how humans are meant to be. Sitting in front of, you know, Wi-Fi and computers all day, yeah. that's not how humans are meant to be. So do you think, like, there's, with all that's going on, like, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think it's it's something nefarious that is trying to, like, because you also mentioned this idea of, like, a transhumanist agenda. Yeah. What do you think is going on? Because also... I find it interesting because sometimes my mind does go in those directions yeah. and it can get kind of depressing. Yeah, yeah. But then also it comes back to also what you were saying, which is that if we need these to be truly healthy, things like touch and real water, it also seems like the further we go down that route, it's almost unsustainable in a way because we can't get away from these things about what it means to be wild, like to drink yeah. real water, to have real sunshine. Like we can mimic these things, but at some point the artificiality of that won't sustain us. Yeah. It's it's probably one of the most challenging, difficult things in our society today. Um, because I think what you describe as it like getting hot, you know, and also like when you're, you know, let's say you spend a uh, many hours working in front of a computer, you get, you feel like drained and that's your battery getting drained. You know, you have to recharge it because there's an, there is most definitely an electrical component to, to our human physiology. And, and that gets sort of like brushed under the side, especially by these big companies. Um, there's, there's a lot of money involved in it. 
you know so we, we can we can go down the rabbit hole of okay who's controlling this and you know it's Rothschild and all this stuff and that's a very dark place man and and at the end of the day it's that's to me personally that's not the approach I take even though I know a whole lot about it because the at the end of the day it's empowerment and adaptation and what you said about science you know which has been lost the, the element of observation that's really the key to having a really good scientific method right it's like oh I can observe that after you've gone through your dieta and you come back into a scenario it happened to me too when I went I went to Costa Rica to do uh, to do a uh, two-week um, consulting and, and, and a couple things and I was by the mountain there was no electromagnetic frequencies there it was like there was like a fiber optic so you can connect the internet and check your email and stuff like that and it was so quiet and the stars and it was like unbelievable you felt you know like oh this is like like this there's a discharge the second I got back it was like everything was louder everything and I'm not just talking about the noise I'm talking about the energy between people, the electromagnetic frequencies and things like that. Uh, I, I think we're in a place where the starting point might just be not burying our head in the sand. It's a convenient thing. Most of us are addicted to it. Um, it's giving you a false sense of dopamine. But at the end of the day, you also have to feel your gut and go, okay, this dopamine hit that I'm getting is unnatural and it's making me more moody, aggressive, and all these elements. So having starting there by having that awareness, you know, it it takes away from the whole element of like there's these studies that show that no electromagnetic frequencies are safe. Well, these studies have been funded by the same companies who are trying to build a scenario where everything is a smart everything, smart city, smart whatever. Um, you know, not to get too much and you know, like the whole transhumanism thing is, you know, there's there's a divide. Obviously, there's a for me. Obviously, there's a divide between people who don't necessarily want to participate in a fully transhuman experience. And what does that look like? That looks like having, let's say, something like hydrogel or something that gets injected into your body that creates uh, some kind of metal, kind of like spike protein. Let's just say that hydrogel is a scaffold that starts to be a network of signals that can interact with some of the 5G towers or the 6G towers or anything that's creating smart everything like the 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 internet that what was it called the the inner the internet of of things i think is the term that they use where everything is a smart computer and and part of the situation is that if you have something that interacts with your biological nature that's being injected or you're being exposed to constantly through spraying, I don't know, you know, there's so many different rabbit holes, right? Then there's an element of control where through these sensors, you can tap into the biology of people and in so many ways control them. Now they try to sell it like, oh, because you have nanoparticles in your body, we can now make sure that we know if a cancer is coming or that Alzheimer's can be so forth and so on. So there's an element of that that, that sounds really good that you're like, well, this is a benefit to humanity where they possibly can end disease. But the thing is that when you study the work of people like Buck, Buck Mr. Fuller and things like and Jacques Fresco from the Venus Project and things like that, they start, I think they're right about this, that if, if, you're in, if your biology is interacting with an inorganic element and that's not natural to the human, it's very hard to see how that's going to improve it. Um, I could be wrong in 20 years. I could be wrong. They could be like these, what Ray Kurzweil says, all oh, these nanobots that will clean your body up and all this stuff. Um, I think the end point is getting people all on uh, a very artificial system of living. You know, kind of like Wally. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, you know, like, or The Matrix, where the people are living in pods and they still get to live in a virtual world. And, and there's a lot of people that don't want that. There's a lot of people who do. There's a lot of people who do. So we just have to make that choice. Um, like I said earlier, it's not going to go away. But is there is there proof? And is there's like non non uh, non cell phone you know studies that have been haven't been funded through cell phone companies and these giant 
corporations that have shown that there is an impact to the biology of a human through the effects of these electromagnetic frequencies, yeah, it, it exists. And like you said, intuitively you feel, man, my battery's drained. I need to cut this off, go to the ocean, recharge. Go to the sun, recharge. Um, so my thing is, look, we have to adapt to these worlds. We have to adapt to the natural world, which we are lacking right now. That's the, that's the challenge. You know, we have to have fitness for the natural world. We have to have fitness for the cyber world. It's, you know, we have to interact with that world, whether we like it or not. And, and we have to have fitness around the urban world. You know, a lot of people live in cities. You know, are we fit to live in a city? Some people are. If, if all it takes is you sitting all day in front of a computer, you're very fit to live in a confined space. Uh, but are you fit for the natural world where that's where you recharge? That's where you bring in some of this rewilding. And I think we need all of it. And maybe we don't need the artificial stuff, but we need the other things to counterbalance that. Um, so, because there's some benefits to the technology. I mean, we're sitting here talking and I'm thinking a lot of people might watch and listen to this conversation we're having. That's amazing. Um, there's a lot of things that the technology brings forth. But again, it's how do we bring balance to it? And I think we can. Now, there's, this is not an area of expertise for me, but I've looked a little bit into it that there's actually ways of using electromagnetic frequencies to heal the body. So there are technologies that have been discovered for years uh, that have been suppressed because they're actually scalar form waves that help heal the body. And these have been available like underground and things like that. So there is a way where we can interact by changing the technology in a way that is not harmful for people. And we can still have it. So it's a huge, it's a huge uh, subject. You mentioned some like really practical things like turning off the Wi-Fi at night. I think that's a great option because yeah. again, most people aren't using the Wi-Fi at night, so why not? Yeah. Why not turn it off? Yeah. Um, obviously, here in Miami, going to the beach, getting sunshine. Uh, do you know anything else? Like if someone's in an apartment and they don't maybe have access to the ocean or the sunshine, like things like copper or salt crystals or anything. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, those salt crystals are good to deionize the air and take some of those charges. And, and shift it um, but to, to be honest like anybody who has anybody and, and we all have access to nature in some way or form even if you live in a small apartment you go out and you ha you'll have trees anywhere you know and all you have to do is take your, your shoes off because that rubber stops the, con the, the, the electro the negative conductivity from the earth that's actually anti-inflammatory and it heals you you can take your shoes off and just spend five ten minutes a day just grounding yourself and everybody has access to that one way or the other it might not be the beach it might not be a forest it might not be the ideal thing but we all have access to it even touching a tree so uh that's one thing that anybody can do for free and just have that awareness and practice and then there's other devices that you can get like um like uh, i have a, a a cube that's made from that's made from a company called man why why can't i remember it Maybe I'll get back, I'll, I'll but uh, I forget, I don't know why I forgot. It's just there in my house. What it does is it takes the software. Fine, we can put it yeah, we'll put it in the show notes or something. But, um, but they basically created uh, a little cube that uses scalar waves to basically disassemble the software element of these electromagnetic frequencies. So it won't stop the actual electromagnetic frequency from, from creating that inflammatory effect but it'll, sh it'll, it'll shift the wave pattern of it so that your body can actually now interact with it in a way that's not harmful. Mm. And it's pretty, it's, it, I, I think it works. I mean, there's, there's people who've had like detox reactions from it, from having it, um, Blue Shield, it's called Blue Shield. Mm. I can send you some info on it, but uh, there's stuff like that, copper rods, you know, you can make, some people make their own like little amber, devices with uh, like amber uh, cubes and things with copper in it and uh, other resonant minerals and things like that that supposedly uh, like organ uh, supposedly like take the charge down and help but easy is just shut off that wi-fi at night um find your breaker or put a timer on the on the wi-fi router like you know and and 
and just make it so that it shuts off, off on its own so that you don't have to think about it. I have a habit already. Like I know my router has a, on the, on my brake panel, it has a, a, um, a switch where I shut it down. It doesn't shut off anything that we don't need. So it'll turn off the Wi-Fi at night before I go to bed, turn it off. Ideally you want to, you know, in an ideal world, you might want to have to just, uh, do fiber optics and just use cables and there's ways of doing it you know so some people go that far um stuff like that yeah. so you you gave me a copy of this book yeah um, what can you what can you say about that well the book the book i was starting to write it before the whole covid thing happened and the the purpose of it is exactly what we've been talking about what are some actual practical things that people can do to enhance their bodies, their mental and spiritual um, health. And it talks about calcification in there, fibrosis. It talks about the food, the kingdoms of food. It, it talks about water. It talks about all these different lifestyle elements that you can start to weave into your body, into your life, into your life so that it becomes almost like a habit and a practice. And I made it so that I wrote it so that it's easy to read simple and it focuses more on solutions how to improve your immune system and i put the whole COVID thing in there because this has been an eye-opening experience for i think the whole world you know i i was like okay let's 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 use it let's use this so that people can also make a distinction between fear-based COVID and oh this is not what we're told it is so if you rewild COVID, you bring nature back into the mix and you don't have to worry about some of the, some programs and some of the things that other people are like pushing down your your field. So that's that's one of the reasons why I, I kind of wrote the book. Um, it has a lot of great resources. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the diet principles, some some supplementation, things about the gut, a couple of things, simple, short, and sweet, so that anybody can grab it and be like, I can do this. I can actually do this. It talks to you about the pufas and how to start by changing that oil, like we mentioned before earlier today um and things like that so yeah yeah i mean you know it's interesting like even with with covid i i would imagine a, a large percentage of people probably like aren't familiar with like really simple things like mm -hmm. i think even the cdc came out and said uh obesity increases your chance of death by by tenfold yeah you know countries that have higher obesity rates ten tenfold increase in death rates I mean, yeah that's huge yeah you know, it's uh, imagine decreasing that risk by tenfold. Yeah, I mean that's huge, and yet it seems like it's something that's not really talked about. Yeah, and, you know, it's something that's been mentioned with COVID. Is is obviously you mentioned this idea of like a, a lot of fear mm -hmm. based kind of tax tactics and and, and media and, and propaganda, um, and it's something that's been said a lot, but very rarely do we hear like what are what are real solutions yeah. that you can do like things like losing weight i mean that's why isn't that being talked about yeah. again a tenfold decrease sunshine <laughs> it's all in there it's circadian rhythms how to get yeah. better sleep all that stuff is in there because that's what we need a lot of this stuff is under our control you know like you don't need uh, a little pharmaceutical vial to control your obesity or control your blood sugar. You can do that with lifestyle and food and nutrition and movement and all this other stuff that we've been talking about. I mean, even a simple thing as, as taking your circadian rhythms, which is very powerful, and aligning those to the natural rhythms of the earth, that right there gets your insulin and your blood sugar remediated very quickly. You know, I had a client though, he was doing technically everything right. Keto diet, personal trainer, doing all this stuff. He's like, I check my, my blood sugar every morning. My doctor wants to, me to take metformin or this medication. And I don't really want to. What else can I do? And it's not going down. I'm doing everything right, and the numbers aren't, aren't going down. I said, look, a year ago, I told you about this circadian rhythm thing, about blocking blue light, at, artificial blue light at night, getting sun in the morning, turning off your Wi-Fi, try it for three days and see what happens. Do me that favor, try it for three days. And he did. And his blood sugar after the third day was back to normal. Mm -hmm. Just with that. So, why? Because your natural rhythms and your hormones are functioning the way they're supposed to. So now you're not producing excess insulin at the wrong time because the artificial light is giving you a mixed signal. 
if the artificial light at nine o'clock or ten o'clock is giving you a signal that hey you gotta go out there and hunt or you know work or do whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing at, at noon which that natural blue light from the sun is there for that reason but if you're doing it at night then it completely disrupts all your hormones and when you do that that's it your leptin your insulin all these hormones that are meant to be uh, are designed for you to have a satiated appetite control of your blood sugar and all this stuff they start to get fixed just with that one thing of blocking that blue light at night and getting some some calibration in the morning with 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 sun through your eyes not with glasses not with sunglasses just getting at least five minutes of sunlight sends the right signals through the eyes to the brain telling you okay it's a new day and we this is this is a cascade of hormones that we need to start to send through not one that's completely uh, opposite to what you're naturally uh, designed for so yeah simple things man I mean we take for granted a lot of the simple things and that's free I mean maybe you have to get blue blocking glasses and that'll cost you what the first pair that you get they range anywhere from 15 bucks to depending on if you want stylish ones and all this stuff it'll cost 60 bucks or whatever but you don't even need those you just you can just work with your environment there's software you can put like flux or you know irisstech.co which basically you can install on the computer and the computer when it's when the sun's going down it starts to change the screen and the flicker rate which gives a lot of people headaches that flicker rate from the light it's you know you don't see it with your blind eye but but if you take a, a, a phone and you put a slow uh, motion camera a video slow mo video on the lights you'll see it that it goes like this bah, 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 and that flicker rate is still is still being sent to the brain a lot of people get headaches because of that again you're getting dehydrated from it too so these are simple things you know, grounding is free yeah sometimes you have to invest in a water filter that costs two thousand dollars you know uh or you start with one that's 400 bucks and you work your way up you know there's different things and you do little by little eliminating pufas polyunsaturated fatty acids that's not that hard it's just changing your oil um so we have a lot more power than than we think we do and our choices are the ones that are going to change the whole system not not trying to go the political route or trying to change some of these big companies by going out in the street and telling them that genetically modified foods are, or glyphosate is horrible, even though, yeah, there's a place for that. But if we choose enough to avoid these things, the companies are gonna go, oh, they're not buying our product anymore. We gotta, we gotta change this. So those are some of the tips that I think can empower us big time. Do you think that's a, because to me that seems like a really important thing you said, which is kind of goes back to that idea of responsibility in, in action and in choice. Yeah. And you know, it seems so much is we want to put the responsibility out there. Like mm -hmm. The government needs to do it, yeah. the, the mayor needs to do it, yeah. the community needs to do it. Yeah. But I'm always somehow separate from that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't need to do it. Someone else yeah. has to do it. Um, because it seems like such a big thing, yeah. and yet, you know, a community, a, a government, a society is comprised of individuals, mm -hmm. and and every the only individual we have control over is, is ourselves. ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Self accountability, responsibility, like you said, can go a long, long way. Um, I've been living like this for many, many years. I don't really get sick. I don't have any issues with with any sort of health, aside from maybe getting food poisoning once in a while, because I didn't, I, again, I didn't tap into, you know, I ate something that was whole the other day, and it really destroyed me. <laughs> but aside from that, it's, you know, I don't. I'm, I'm pretty much thriving, and my family's thriving, and it's because we have all these habits and lifestyle choices that we've made, and they didn't happen overnight. You know, we've just woven in one thing at a time, one thing at a time, and we educate our kids, and they educate other kids, and they notice, you know. So, yeah, it's it, it can seem overwhelming, but if you go one step at a time, it's not. And if, if enough of us do it, um, the world will change in a better way, for sure. So, Do you think there's also a, a spiritual component that's led you down this journey, like a, a search for something bigger than yourself, a search for meaning that... 
I think for a lot of people, when there's that sense of overwhelm or that sense of disconnection, a lot of the source of that, and it's something that, that I find a lot in my work, even when I first started doing it, a lot of the kind of indigenous doctors that I worked with really spoke about that a lot of the problems we're suffering from are spiritual problems. And they would look at things on three levels. That there's the physical level, but even that is very highly affected by our mental emotional state. But then even that is affected by this level of spirit. And in the beginning, that seemed like a little strange. Like I kind of thought I understood it, but it took, a, I think, a long time for me to really like begin to see what they were pointing to in a much deeper level. And it's this, this disconnect, this, this sense of, of separation, yeah. that I'm not part of something bigger, that my actions actually, that they don't have meaning, that um, there's, no, there's no higher purpose, there's, there's no curiosity begins to fall away, a sense of awe yeah. begins to fall away, a sense of empowerment begins to fall away, and we start having kind of this darkness that tinge, or kind of, it puts a... It, it puts this like tint on everything that we begin to look at rather than like, you know, as you said, like how can we be that change? How can we start to take action yeah. from, from, from a place of empowerment? Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. I mean, this, is, this is a spiritual journey first. Um, you know, we are, we are grounded in a physical experience, but at the end of the day, you know, I think all of us want some form of purpose. And some purpose is simple. It's like I can be the best father I can be for my, my kids and show up 100% every day. Uh, and other times your purpose is spreading the word about empowerment and these lifestyle elements that, that do make a big difference. Uh, I think definitely this is all a spiritual uh, evolution too. So, uh, you know, there's, there's gratitude for what's happened as well. Because without it, uh, we might still be just marching along, you know, not doing with very little awareness of what the world is. And we couldn't, I don't think we can sustain the way we've been living for the last hundred years any longer. There's so many things that, that need to change for that to happen. So <clears throat> I think with, with 2020, COVID, 2021, with everything that's happening now, I think we are being we are being challenged to explore that spirituality in a very balanced way so that we can come together. I mean, that's why you talk about intelligence so many, uh, a few times you've talked about that. That's why that's, you know, I've noticed that that's been an area of growth that is tremendous. And you see how that medicine comes to people through channels that you're like, wow, you know, this thing's actually getting here for the benefit of humanity. Some people will, will, will get it at the right time, the right way, etc. And there's a there's a spiritual intellect there. There's a spiritual uh, frequency and, and divine aspect to it that I don't think we can explain it. Maybe it doesn't need to be explained. But if we tap into it, you know, there's there's a lot of power there. Yeah. You said you started a podcast. Can you? Yeah, it's all about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's called Rewild Humanity. <laughs> Rewild Humanity. And the, and the essence of it is exactly that. It's to try to bring in guests and some of my perspectives and share them with people to move that element of, of self-control, accountability, empowerment, tools that we can use and remind ourselves that we're, we, can, we can transcend through this in a very good way. So there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm revamping the show and doing some more things that are in the nature of helping people that way. So it's fun, you know, it's, it's audio, it's on, you know, iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. There's no video, but, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a nice little project and hopefully I can keep doing it more and more and more so that it expands the educational aspect of it and the community, you know, like we can connect a lot through some of this media especially if it's not mainstream media. We get other voices being heard. Uh, and there's a lot of voices that need to be heard right now that haven't had a chance to come out. And uh, so I'm hoping I can continue that with, with improvement as, as time goes by. 
where do you see your path going? Do you have uh, any any idea for the future? Or just uh, working more, continuing with, with, with food as medicine, as with, with the body work, with podcasting, or do you have other things on your, your radar as well? Yeah, uh, my my goal is to bring more education. That's that's where I tend to light up the most. Uh, the body work is great, but it's it's very intense, you know, and, and you have to have to take, like when I mentioned the food thing, the, the food poisoning thing, that, that was just a mechanism of me discharging a lot of stuff that I take in through working with these people. Because it's not just a spirit, uh, a physical practice. There's a lot of emotion that comes out on that table, like a lot. And people purge out things, and I try to keep my field clean and purge myself, but, you know, being a father for doing that, trying to make a living, all these things, it, it builds and builds and builds until it gets to a point where, you know, your body will force you to purge out. So I'm trying to do less of that and more of the education, building the podcast correctly, doing maybe some online coaching with people, setting up programs that are effective for people, that are not like um, trying to market people to do this and do that. Uh, it's just real, real stuff, real stuff that together, building a community, they can come to me, come to each other, and prepare something that can take us to the next level. Because there's still a lot that we, we can do. There's still a lot to be discovered. You mentioned curiosity before, and you know I've never stopped being curious. So I'll keep doing that, for sure. And, and hopefully I can transcend into the more educational platforms and things like that, and, and, and be there for my family. That's one of the most important things for me, if not the most important. These kids teach me so much, and they're amazing, my wife, and it's just like, it's such a blessing, you know? So, I don't know, maybe I'll do something with parenting as well. We've learned so much. I mean, my wife is a freaking, uh, she's amazing. She had the four kids at home, natural births, three in the water, one she didn't want to do in the water. You know, she's on it with me. You know, she's a mental health counselor. I mean, she's got a lot to offer the world. And, and having the kids at home, the last few years, the last year and a half, because they wanted to mask them up at school and all this stuff, it was it was challenging. But uh, now, thankfully, we're in Florida and we found like a entrepreneur type of school that has a lot of nature in it. That they're not going to make the kids uh, mandatory mask and things like that, and they're going to start there and see and see. They liked it. Um, they did like a trial week that they enjoyed very much and they were very happy and so I'm excited about that because it'll help me and her kind of explore more have more time to you know expand on what we have to offer the world so yeah yeah that's crazy making kids sit eight hours a day with a mask on I mean that's just yeah that's a big fight mm -hmm. so. well that's great man is there anything you, you'd like to talk about that we didn't touch on no, man, I just want to say that I appreciate you, you know, having this conversation with me. It's, it gives me an outlet to share some of the things that I don't get to regularly talk about. And, and, and I would just like to, uh, you know, tell people who are, or share with people who are listening, viewing this, that, you know, we're very powerful. And if we reach that balance, we rewild a little bit and we start to have a perspective around awareness and self-accountability, responsibility, and come together as a, as a whole species of humans that want to coexist in a, in a different, more regenerative way, um, I, think, I think the sky's the limit. I think we can get to a point where the Earth will be that beautiful beacon of what I think we're all capable of, of living through. So I just want to, you know, challenge people and say, hey, you know, come and, and open up and keep going. So, yeah. Well, great, man. Yeah, one of these days, uh, I, I keep wanting to reach out to David, so I'd love to get him on yeah. and uh, hopefully make it accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but it's been a pleasure, man. If, if anyone wants to, to get your book or to, to reach out to you, I mean, because you, you said you do one-on-one -on -one work with people. Yeah, or, yeah, you can go, uh, book is on Amazon. It's also on Rewilding covid.com I have my main page which is shot s c h o t t health.com and you can reach out through there uh, the email should be on there so that you can reach out if you want consultations or anything of that nature I use iridology as well uh, iridology is a study of the iris 
so I can individualize people's program by using that as uh, as a as a tool. You know, everything that happens inside the body gets reflected through the spinal cord into the iris, which is the colored part of the eye. And people send me pictures, and we do like a consultation through that. It's very it's very interesting. It's always like on point. You know, it's like reflexology. So I'll use that as a tool, but you know, I I just want to help people. So you can reach me through all those channels. Amazing. Great, brother. Well, I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's good talking to you. I'm getting yeah. to know you a little bit more. And I, I don't know. For me, I think anyone who was was kind of coming from that path, there, there's something that drew us to it, and, and I think something really special. And you know, also to give thanks to, to all of these people like they yeah. did. And, uh, yeah. And a shout out to John. I'm sure yeah, absolutely. And, um, yeah, man, it's been a pleasure. Hopefully, right. you know, I I'll still probably be coming through Miami. Okay. Again, yeah. So yeah. we'll uh, we'll have to do maybe a round two and go Sounds a little bit good. deeper into some yeah. of this stuff. Sounds good. Yeah. Alright, brother. Thank All right, you. Brother. Yeah, cheers. My man. pleasure, man. You too. Yeah. All right, everybody. That is it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John. Uh, for me, it was really a pleasure to get to sit down with him again and catch up and see what he's been up to. Um, as always, if you're able to help to support this show, that's a really big help. Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Each of those tiers gives you something back. Uh, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Uh, to all the people who have done that, thank you very much because that's a really big help. And if you are able to do that, thank you in advance. Uh, there's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. Um, also now with the YouTube channel, there's an option to join and it gives you back a lot of those same benefits just via the YouTube page. Um, if you're not able to do that, simply subscribing to the show is a really big help, turning on the notification bell, liking the video on the YouTube page, and then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, leaving a starred rating and a short review, following the channel, that's a really big help with the algorithms and getting the show out to a bigger audience. So I think that's it. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoyed this episode. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope you all are well and happy and uh, safe in these very strange times. And uh, thank you for tuning in, and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank you.